Hey, Dr. Wright. Hey, Ashley. Making weight is something that is in basically every sport. How do you encourage athletes to make weight and still maintain integrity while doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, like things like, you know, boxing or fighting or UFC is going to be a lot more stringent than mm-hmm. other sports. I don't think you have to worry too much in football, right? Um, but in in general, um, you know, that's a difficult process and that's a gradual process for people that we get better and better and better at figuring out. But, you know, if it's specific, specific to their sport, then it's going to become primary. If it's less specific, you know, a, a sport like football where it's important but not always immediately necessary, then it's a more gradual process. But really, it's about, you know, creating the set point, you know, where your system takes care of itself, more or less. You know, I mean, obviously cutting weight is another issue for UFC and so on. Mm. But that set point, that's going to be determined largely through your habits and your routines on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Hey, Dr. Hey, Ashley. We've been working with some interns, so we're seeing that sports psychology is becoming something more prevalent. Correct. Um, what's something you can encourage students who are looking to get into sports psychology? What's something you can encourage them to do? You know, I'm a little bit out of the box, so like I'm not a fan of just graduate school alone. I don't think it teaches enough in internships and working for teams. Working for a team obviously would be immensely valuable just because, you know, you're getting so much experience. But that said, I think living abroad, traveling abroad, doing things that, you know, require more courage and more creativity are going to help you train your mind. And you also want to train your mind a lot, regardless of whether you travel or not. Meditative states, mindfulness practice, visualization, breath work. You want to start living the things that you're teaching. That's what I do. And the abroad thing is just a metaphor for having more courage and more creativity. So you want to live this thing and then you can teach it. Hey, Dr. Rudd. Hey, Ashley. In really intense situations in games, how do you encourage athletes, especially at a professional level, to sort of come back to the moment and communicate properly with their teammates instead of just going full barbarian on them? Yeah, well, so, you know, look, if they're, you know, on the bench or something, right, they have an opportunity to work on their breathing before they communicate. Four or five seconds in, four or five second hold, four or five second release, four or five second hold, basic box breathing, or just slowing it down and working on their breath in general, get them a little more patient, a little bit more poised. It's a better way to communicate, right? You're from a better place to start with. So you wanna work on you first, and then from there the communication flows. And then I'm teaching everybody how to communicate without the you are's, right? You're teaching everybody, you know, uh, it seems like, sounds like, feels like certain techniques that have a lot of value. Hey, Dr. Brett. Hey, Ashley. How can you tell, what would you tell a pro athlete who's struggling, you know, on the family side of things, you know, you're, you're pro athletes, or you're traveling a lot, your wife is putting pressure on you. How do you, how do you help them deal with that part? Yeah, so that one's not uncommon and it's super tricky and challenging and it has to be addressed and it's like anything else, it's going to be, you need to be proactive. Um, obviously, the more... If you have children, it gets complicated and everything. Um, but the communication piece is a big part of what we work on, no matter what kind of athlete I'm working with. Pro athletes in particular, if they're traveling a lot, the communication is going to have to be higher. And then when they are home or they are with their partner, their wife or whomever, they're working on being as present as possible because when you're present, you're enhancing your experience in the relationship, and that's valuable. Hey, Dr. Brett. Hey, Ashley. How can athletes maintain that laser-sharp focus, that high level of intensity, and still have a fun life? Yeah, so that's part of the intention, right, is to make it fun along the way. And people lose that, not just athletes, but higher-level athletes in particular, there's much more pressure, right? And so if they're not careful, they're not mindful, then they will lose some of the fun along the way. I'm a, I'm a sounding board and a reminder in part for making the process more fun. Meditative states help a lot as well. I always talk about this because when you go into those deeper meditative states, it gives you more perspective, right? That this thing is fleeting, it's fast, this journey called life, and your time as a pro athlete is gonna be fast. So you wanna enjoy it before the end of your career. Mm. Hey, Dr. Brett. Hey, Ashley. Sometimes eating can be emotional. What do you do when you're dealing with an athlete who's more of an emotional eater? Yeah, I think often eating can be emotional. So you're, 
teaching them how to manage their stress levels throughout the day so they don't get to nighttime or something where they're just unconsciously emotionally eating because they've been stressed throughout the day. So we're getting people a little bit more on point mm. all the time, more self-aware around their you know, mental and emotional states. And as your self-awareness enhances, then the next level is self-discipline. And so we're always working on you know, a combination of self-awareness and self-discipline. As that mm. raises, then your choices are gonna get better everywhere. Mm.